If you do not if you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call or disconnect now. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera or participate only by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed to consent to recording and the use of your voice or image. So um, that's, that's kind of our statement for recording. We also want to let you know that we're going to take questions for all of the panelists using the chat box. So on your drop down, if you have a question, um, please go ahead and post at any time. We'll be monitoring that and get your questions to the panelists. So on the drop down, please make sure you use the all panelists when you have a question. And we encourage you to um, ask questions throughout. So looking forward to that with that. Hello, and welcome to the South by Southwest EDU virtual panel. The STEM future is female strategies and actions. Featuring three amazing women, Sabrina Abu Hamde from the State Department, Rita Barinwal from the Department of Energy, and Lisa Guerra from NASA, who will talk today about how they are supporting women and girls in STEM. I'm Melinda Higgins, and I will be your moderator for the day. Our first featured speaker is Sabrina Abu Hamde, who is the Senior Partnerships Advisor in the Office of Global Partnerships at the U.S. Department of State. Sabrina, over the last three years, has managed the public-private partnership WiSci. WiSci um, refers to Women in Science Girls STEAM Camp. We are so excited to hear more. Sabrina. Thank you very much, Melinda. Am I on? Can you hear me? Oh, it's beeping at me. Um, sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Melinda. I'm really excited to be here, and I am I am honored to be in company of such distinguished panelists, truly. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, Okay, so I actually have some, yes, I have some slides to share. Um, so I think they're coming up now. I can start speaking and say that, um, as Melinda said, I work in the Office of Global Partnerships, and so I'd like to speak a little bit about what we do, um, just to give everyone a better idea of what um, that means to us at the State Department. And I also want to speak, obviously, about YSI, which is our summer STEAM camp for high school girls. Um, is the, are the slides up? Ah, okay. <laughs> See, it's more fun with slides. Um, so, um, so, yes, so I want to talk a little bit about what we do in Office of Global Partnerships. So a big one is we develop partnerships like YSI, and YSI is our longest running in-house um, partnership. And so what YSI and our partnerships are, are essentially co-created um, entities, partnerships that we want to do um, around an, like a subject area that matters to all involved. And so this is kind of a new -er idea for the State Department and USD generally because we're used to a much more transactional kind of situation where we have a contract or a grant where we pay people to do something, but we aren't like coming together around a problem that we want to try to solve or impact together. And so what partnerships are are very much co-created with all the partners. And so they're extremely rewarding and then can be a little bit challenging and can be hard for people to the State Department to kind of wrap their heads around sometimes. So we offer trainings on public-private partnerships and private sector engagement, like different tools and techniques. And we also um, help by consulting with offices on our partnership with ideas they have and how to make them happen and operationalize them. Our office also handles uh, vetting and, and due diligence, which we do for all new private sector or partners that we are thinking of working with. And I just wanted to note that private sector means 
everybody that's not USG. <laughs> so I, I used to be a little confused by that myself. But uh, so that's universities, NGOs, associations, businesses, not USG. And the last thing we do, which is kind of overarching and everything, you know, part of everything we do, which is private sector engagement. So we are always, you know, on the lookout for some like-minded potential partners, and we hold different events where we come around an issue like um, we did for Zika, I imagine in the future, maybe COVID-19, we've had lots of chatting about it, but that's essentially what we do. I just wanted to throw up the statistic that our office uses quite a bit because it's pretty powerful. So in 1970, the U.S. government, you know, did the majority of international financial assistance, um, or foreign assistance, excuse me. And then now the tables have completely turned and the private sector is, it does the bulk of it. And one reason that, I mean, I, is very interesting to me is that, well, that makes sense because we've become so much more globalized in how we do business and interconnected. And so for companies, it makes business sense, essentially, to have to strengthen economies and societies and, you know, enhance workers' lives in places where they are operating because this improves their productivity, enhances kind of their products. So uh, next slide, please. So I'll, okay, <laughs> I don't want to, I'll keep going. Um, so next I wanted to go into the White Side Girls theme camp, which we're so excited about and I could talk for days on, so I will keep it uh, tight. So we all know the problem. I think that's everyone on this call kind of knows what that's all about. Um, why we got involved at the State Department was in 2015, there we held the Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, D.C. It was a very, very big deal. Um, Leaders from across the African continent came, met with U.S. leaders. It was big, big deal. And from that, came, there came out some, you know, areas where we collectively wanted to focus, and one of which was girls' education. So our office worked with UN Foundation's Girl Up and Intel to create the WISI Partnership, which is, a, you know, in its current iterations, it's been a summer Theme camp for high school girls. It's two weeks, all expenses paid, and they've been held throughout the world. And we bring girls from different regions and the U.S. together for this camp. And what is particularly, you know, exciting for someone who's very into partnerships is that this is all done collectively with our partners. So our partners create and deliver all the curriculum that we have at the camp. The Google, Intel, Girl Up, American Society of Microbiology, NASA, and um, and others, all oh, Department of Energy, um, have all you know brought curriculum to the table to teach the girls. And we focus on leadership and also on STEAM um, and different STEAM subjects. So um, next slide, please. <laughs> I'm used to being in control of the slides. <laughs> Um, so just a couple statistics about YSI, um, you know, by the numbers, we've, we've done a good job, we're excited, but, you know, obviously we have so much more we'd like to do, and I wanted to highlight that we have brought in a new partner this year, Caterpillar, we have wonderful partners in um, Google and Intel and Girl Up, and we also have developed a like a fantastic um, relationship with the Millennium Challenge Corporation who has led on a couple of the camps and they were going to lead on a camp this summer, which I'll talk about briefly in a moment. But it's, it's an exciting partnership. Next slide, please. So I did want to take a moment to talk about kind of the elephant in the room, like why, why everything is the way it is. Um, and kind of how that's impacted us. So obviously we've had to postpone our camps for this summer and we're looking to 2021. Um, and also, you know, in the moment we, I don't know, I think like everyone in the world just kind of was in shock and then trying to figure out, okay, now what? Now what do we do? We're all at home. 
And so we really tried to take this as, I mean, sad and everything, but I'm not going to go into all that language about what this is, but, um, but take it as an opportunity and think, well, what can we do now that we're at home? What can we do with the girls? Some don't even have internet connections, but we're trying to work on offline things. But what we did come up with was to do reunion Zoom calls. So Girl Up rolled out, like, that's the first thing, to do calls with different girls, like alumna from the different camps, and those have been very successful. Second thing is we're working with a new partner, and we're really excited about this partnership that we can't talk too much about yet, but um, we're going to be offering online courses and cloud computing basics, and we're hoping to definitely expand that out more beyond kind of the white side girls that it's focused on right now and see what we can do through that. And then also finding ways to attract new partners because just because we're all at home doesn't mean the world hasn't stopped and everyone still has goals they'd like to achieve for you know their company's social impact or NGO or foundation. And so thinking about the new kind of programming we can do to attract new partners. So that is kind of an exciting, it's an exciting opportunity, even though it was like a hard pivot. So, um, and then the next slide, just wanted to wrap up and say thank you. Um, show on uh, the website that, um, the Girl Up website, and we also have a global partnerships office website, but I would Google that instead of, um, I putting up the link, it was pretty unwieldy when I put it on the slide. So thank you very much, and thank you to my fellow panelists for the time. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sabrina. How exciting to hear about a partnership that engages girls on a global um, basis in STEM. So sounds wonderful. Next, we have Dr. Rita Barenwall, who's the Assistant Secretary in the Office of Nuclear Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Rita, the first woman to to lead the Office of Nuclear Energy will focus the office's efforts to promote research and development on existing and advanced nuclear technologies, maintain the existing fleet of nuclear reactors, and promote the development of a robust pipeline of advanced reactor designs and supply chain capabilities. Rita? Thank you very much, Melinda. Can you hear me okay? Okay, very good. Thank you everybody for joining us. I appreciate your time. Um, I wish we could be doing this in person, but um, I do think there's a silver lining here. We currently have over 300 participants and I doubt very much that we would have been able to reach this many people had we done this in person in Austin. So um, I, I, I'm very grateful for the situation that it, you know, it is what it is, but um, thank you very much. Uh, before I get started with my prepared remarks, I want to mention a couple things. Uh, we are coming to you um, via, the, via the, the WebEx function, um, which means that we have been trying to work through and go to school through this pandemic. And to all of the educators out there, I give uh, my sincere thank you and appreciation for what uh, you have had to do in a very short amount of time to get lesson plans um, prepared and executed online. So thank you for that. Um, I would be remiss if we didn't recognize that May is National Mental uh, Health Awareness Month. Um, and I know that many of us have, uh, myself included, gone through very different emotions as we've progressed through these past several weeks. So just a, a gentle reminder for all of us um, to pause when we need to, to take breaks. Uh, when necessary, to make time to sleep and exercise, um, to reach out and to stay connected. Um, I recently reconnected with a childhood friend that I had not spoken to in over 30 years, and um, all we did was exchange messages over Messenger, and so it's, it was really, really nice. Um, and then finally, to seek help um, if, if we're overwhelmed um, or feel unsafe. Um, very specifically to, to the educators again, um, what you do is so important. Um, I had an interaction with my eighth grade teacher when I was in eighth grade, and that moment still sticks out uh, in my mind and definitely was a turning point for me and helped me get to where I am today. So please never underestimate um, the value of an interaction, of an outreach, of a parent-teacher conference. Um, those are very, very important, and, and again, I thank you. 
So what we do in my office uh, of nuclear energy in the Department of Energy is promote research and development, as, as Melinda had mentioned. But I want to take a step back from that for a moment. Nuclear energy is responsible for generating 20% of the electricity in the United States. But it's actually responsible for much more of this country's clean energy. It's responsible for over 55% of the clean energy generated in the United States. And that's really important, especially today, given, given our environment and with all of um, our countries and, and states' decarbonization goals, to have nuclear energy as part of an energy portfolio. Not only is nuclear energy uh, good for producing electricity, it's certainly very important to medical applications in terms of detecting and treating certain cancers, for example. And it's also very important for space exploration. So one of the one of the uh, pictures behind me is uh, from a project that I worked on. It was a joint project with NASA uh, earlier in my career, and we were developing nuclear reactors to uh, help go to Jupiter to explore the icy moons. And so there's a lot of different applications for nuclear energy, and it's a really exciting place to be right now. But let's focus on STEM, which is why I, I suspect all of you have tuned in. Um, STEM education is very important to, to my office, and it's, um, it's important to ensure that we have the future generation of researchers and scientists to further advance nuclear energy. My office has a vested interest in building a talented and innovative, diverse workforce to support our mission in nuclear energy. The complexity of nuclear energy and its broad impact throughout its life cycle really necessitates the need to develop, expand, and enhance educational opportunities and scholarships for K through 12 youth related to STEM. In my office, we have scholarships and internships that help to support students in the post-secondary stage, but we also have a concerted effort afoot that engages the earliest stages of the workforce pipeline, and that's the K through 12 students. Uh, STEM education is especially important to our underrepresented populations, including young women, and this is the focus of the U.S. government at large and also in, in my office. By encouraging all students to engage in STEM, we can tap, increased, tap into increased multiple different perspectives and diverse views that help us find innovative solutions for the energy challenges of today and tomorrow. Um, at the moment, I'm reading a book called Range, and it really leverages this idea of bringing different analogous experiences to help forward and, and, uh, and encourage projects to succeed. And that's precisely what bringing different students in from diverse backgrounds and diverse view viewpoints into the STEM field. So it's a really, really good comparison. Um, our partnership in the Office of Nuclear Energy with the American Nuclear Society and Discovery Education allows free online K-12 learning resources in nuclear energy for all students. It's called Navigating Nuclear, Energizing Our World. We're a network partner in the 100K in 10, and they have identified a challenge of many teachers, and that's the availability of resources for pre-K through 12 uh, STEM teachers to integrate science standards into instruction. Our Navigating Nuclear Virtual Field Trip of Idaho National Laboratory premiered this past February. It reached over 4,000 classrooms and over 180,000 students across the country in the first month that it was available on our website. Also, there have been over 450 downloads of our educator guides that accompanies that field trip, and it gives educators ready access to free online STEM activities and career awareness lessons. And I have to add, I used to work at Idaho National Laboratory, and that virtual field trip exposed me to areas that I didn't even know existed at the lab. So even for folks that have been there before, you might find something new in that virtual field trip. I want to move on for a second to girls in STEM and, and why it's important that we talk about this. I was, I was giving a webinar last week, and one of the questions in the chat room was, oh, we're talking about the women thing again. And it's, it's disappointing me, to me that we still have that sentiment, um, but that's okay, it, you know, we'll, we'll get there. And the reason why it's important that we talk about girls in STEM and why we focus on them in some aspects is about exposing folks to opportunities. And my firsthand experience is that I never um, really understood what materials engineering was about until I saw my first 
scanning electron microscope. And so it was exposure to this field that I ended up getting three degrees in, um, where I may not have majored in, in this discipline had I not had that opportunity to, to, to tour such a facility. And so it's about giving, giving people exposure to opportunities. Girls need to know that all STEM fields are open to them, and we need to help them see themselves in those, in those fields. Many girls do see themselves as creative. That's 91% of them see themselves as creative, but only 37% see STEM jobs as creative. And while uh, up to 72% of girls want to have a job that helps the world, only 37% think certain STEM jobs can help save the world. So the impact of having female role models is really significant. Girls who know a woman in STEM feel more powerful pursuing STEM, uh, understand the relevancy of STEM more, and feel better uh, equipped to, to pursue a career in STEM. And we also want to make sure that we support women throughout their careers, inspiring them to pursue STEM careers and being a good mentor during their career so we can de decrease attrition as they do move along their STEM journey. Thank you very much again for your time today, and I look forward to having our, our chat questions with you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rita. Your leadership inspires us. So next we have Lisa Guerra, who has 30 years of experience in the NASA aerospace community with a background in aerospace engineering. Lisa is currently affiliated with the Office of the Administrator at NASA headquarters as a senior technical advisor working a wide range of agency issues, particularly initiatives around program management acquisition, strategy, um, and NASA workforce and operating model. So Lisa. Thank you, Melinda. And thank you for the panelists joining me today. So I would like to share with you what NASA is doing to grow the female population in STEM. Next slide. So for NASA, we start with our incredible role models. I'm sure all of you have heard of our hidden figures. And at NASA, we continue to uncover our historical women who contributed so much behind the scenes and they still continue to inspire us today. In fact, this year, we just named the street that I work on as Hidden Figures Way. So we're reminded of them every day we go to work. And of course, we have our amazing female astronauts. Most notably this year with Christina Koch and Jessica Meir performing the first all-female spacewalk. I was glued to my desk watching NASA TV for eight hours, cheering them on, and it was so inspiring that once again, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, they made it look so easy. And in addition to our more high profile uh, figures, we have our senior NASA women, like myself, who continuously serve as role models through speaking engagements to female students. The event pictured here was at Goddard Space Flight Center of our most senior women a few years ago, and they were addressing a group of about 500 high school girls, telling them their journey, their story, how they got where they are today. So in addition to formal events like that featuring our women, we also accept individual events. And I just recently spoke to an all-girl high school in our local area. And I was telling Melinda before we started that I brought stickers for everyone. And the principal wrote me back and said, now every girl's computer has a NASA sticker on it. <laughs> so we inspire in many different ways. Next slide. So NASA has 10 centers around the country and they work at the local level to engage girls in STEM activities. Every year, the Goddard Space Flight Center hosts a Girls' Night In, which is a sleepover at Goddard where they get to know, meet, and be mentored by NASA female engineers and scientists. 
At the Jet Propulsion Lab, they host a summer immersion program where they are collaborating with Los Angeles's Girls Who Code program. And then many of our other centers, they take advantage of these larger scale partnerships that NASA has with groups like the Girl Scouts and the FIRST Robotics. And so we do hands-on activities for Girl Scout troops or we sponsor and mentor all-girl teams for FIRST Robotics. Next slide. Finally, NASA offers hands-on experiences for high school and college students with the intent of encouraging them to pursue STEM careers. We offer many design challenges that often attract all-girl teams. One of the teams pictured here is for our student launch initiative that we conduct at the Marshall Space Flight Center, where they get hands-on experience building and launching rockets. We also fund student internships at all of the 10 NASA centers. And we keep track of our gender statistics with the intent of growing the female population. This year, we've just started embarking on longitudinal studies to see if our intern experiences actually translate into STEM careers. And it was interesting in meeting Rita through this panel to find out that she too was a NASA intern. So uh, she can be our first data point since it definitely led to a STEM career. Next slide. So our three government agencies today um, have various STEM activities and resources that have been mentioned and you can access them at these websites. For the NASA material, it's geared not only for students, but also the educators. And since we've been in the COVID-19 situation, we've actually developed a NASA at home, which has special activities that parents can do with their student children who are home with them. And it's been wildly successful. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Melinda. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, NASA, always a cornerstone for engaging women in STEM. So we thank you so much for that. So we've got a few questions from our audience. Um, the first one I'll read out and just whoever would like to take it, that would be fantastic. And so um, the first question, how do you all engage with the Department of Education? And is girls in STEM a priority for the agency? And as, again, follow up, is there funding available for state-based STEM programs at the federal level? Well, I can start. In terms of working with the Department of Energy, NASA has been very involved in the Coast STEM activities, which is a national effort to document our goals as a country in moving forward in the STEM curriculum and fields. And NASA has actually co-led that activity for a number of years. And you can look up the co-STEM reports. Um, what was the second part of the question? Is there funding available for state-based STEM programs at the federal level? That I can't answer for NASA, right. I'm not sure. Right. Right. And we can, we can kind of um, get back to you on that if, and, and move on to the next question. Thank you so much for those questions, though. Um, another one we have is, um, can you point, and this is great because this is one I had I'd talked to the panelists about, can you point to a specific person or experience that pushed you to the STEM field? It's one of our audience questions. Just anybody that wants to take that, or we could go through all three if that's okay with you all. Oh, I, ahead, I can Rita. start. This, this is Rita. 
Um, so my earliest memory um, of something STEM related was actually putting together a bookshelf uh, when I was a kid, assembling it. And I remember um, my dad saying, well, here's the instructions. And I was like, I don't need the instructions. Let me just figure this out. And so um, it took a couple tries. But um, I really remember, I remember really enjoying that experience of building and, and problem solving, even though I, I might have had the solution, right, the, the manual <laughs> on how to do it um, as a backup. But, but just being allowed that opportunity versus um, perhaps my parents saying, no, we'll, we'll put it together, or no, you must use the instruction manual to put this together. Having a little bit of that flexibility and, and the opportunity to, to perhaps make a mistake on my own um, is something that still sticks out to me today. And I'm guessing I was probably about seven or eight years old at the time. That's awesome. Thank you. And I think, Lisa, you were willing to share about a mentor as well on the question. Well, my early push, um, as you could guess, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and I was inspired by the Apollo program and landing astronauts on the moon. So of course I thought I would be an astronaut, but when I was applying to college in the 70s, I, I was reminded that women weren't astronauts at that time. And so you better find something else you wanna do. And so one of my high school counselors actually sent me to an engineering camp and I was just amazed. And I thought, okay, if I can't be the one in the spacecraft, I can be the one designing the spacecraft. And that's basically what my early career was all about, was spacecraft design. And I attribute my counselor in high school to really pushing me. That's awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Sabrina, here's one for you. Um, uh, one of the participants wanted to know, does YSA have an evaluation report or annual report to share? Actually, we do have an evaluation. A couple of years ago, we um, were able to partner with Deloitte and d did an evaluation of kind of where the girls are now. And the other half of that evaluation was looking at partners and what motivated them to be part of YSI, which is, which is an important, a big important factor <laughs> and since this is like a partnership and we want to make it sustainable. So one interesting side, and maybe not answering your question, but from the partnership side is that um, the workforce development aspect was a, a big deal because we have trainers coming from different organizations to the camps and experiencing the camps, mentoring the girls. And so that was um, a key component for why a couple of the entities are involved is that kind of workforce engaged. And that, I should, shouldn't have said development, I said, I should have said workforce engagement element, <laughs> potential workforce development. So, um, and so we have that. We also have uh, statistics on the website, um, girlup.org. And um, we don't have like a formal annual report um, right now, but we are working to kind of build up a secretariat. Um, we're very lucky to have the UN Foundation's Girl Up is kind of helming that effort. So um, there's more information there. And I mean, I'd be happy to share the report. I, I'll find out how. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabrina. Okay, another question. What do you think is the best strategy for NGOs to reach and have meaningful impact on girls interested in STEM? I could start on that, yeah, actually. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say, because I, I handle the grants in our office and the Wi-Fi grant, and um, it, it's really important to know, know your business of applying for grants. Make sure you understand all the language, um, because that is truly the way we, we mainly in USG, we work with NGOs is kind of know your stuff and then know how to showcase that properly for the audience you're um, working with. So there's a lot of like jargon in the, in the NOFOs we put out, the notice of funding opportunities and kind of understanding those nuances are really helpful. 
obviously, I mean, especially in our office, we, we really like to, you know, prop up the little guy. So it's not that you have to be this super established NGO to get somewhere, but it does really help um, for you to at least have everything written out as best you can. And so that's maybe a more technical answer, but I would say grants are uh, a, a big way to engage with the government and they're all available online. And find others who've done it too. I mean, this goes back to mentorship. Like I always find someone else who wrote a NOFO or I find other NOFOs that we've had in the past and then they, okay, that was a good one. So I need to put all this in mind. <laughs> so, um, you know, just doing your homework. I hope that helps. Okay, thank you, Sabrina. Um, another audience question, they're just coming in. This is awesome. Do you think that there is any harm in considering STEAM altogether? For example, many girls experience higher levels of math anxiety. If they think of all science fields as connected to math through STEAM, they might be less inclined to pursue certain scientific interests. And I think they're including A and the STEM for arts for STEAM on that question. Um, anybody interested in taking that one? So I can start, this is Rita. Um, I, I'm certainly not an expert on, on STEM and STEAM, um, but as I look at the question and, and think about it, I, the, the, I would say the benefits of advertising opportunities and um, encouraging uh, folks to pursue STEM, STEM skills far outweighs any potential harm. I think that was the word that was used. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that there may not be th this piece of, you know, uh, perhaps being off-putting to, to some folks to pursue this field, um, but there's many aspects to STEM that aren't, for example, math-related uh, that, that can be of interest. I, I do think it's really important that we focus on the possibilities and the opportunities and then let students decide for themselves, yeah, that's for me or that, that it's not. Even to this point, I know that there's um, students uh, that are participating in this in this web in this session right now. Um, the whole point of a of a postdoc, of an internship, um, uh, of a co-op is is an audition. It's an audition for the student to to fit with the university or the company or the lab, and it's also an audition. It's, it's a trial run for for the employer as well. And then you may not realize, you know what's a fit and what isn't until you actually try it. Um, and, and so I, I would, I would uh, again, just encourage us to continue to focus on making opportunities available and then students can decide, yes, this is a good fit for me or, or no, it's not. And, and let's not um, rush to prejudge or not make options available to, to the students that are out there. Let them be let them be the ones to pick from from the buffet of options that we might be able to put out there, if you will. Thank you, Rita. Perfect. Okay, another question. How can I find STEM role models and stories about women in STEM? So at NASA, we actually have a website called Women at NASA, and it's these very informal interviews with various women scientists and engineers, and you can learn from them. They're still in the workforce. Um, and then various publications, as I mentioned, Hidden Figures. Uh, there's been a number of historical books written about uh, now famous women. Um, so I think it, uh, it's more common to see these books come forward. I know my daughter, who's studying chemical engineering in college, has a whole book called, you know, on women scientists. So I think just a, a search and even searching in NASA archives would help you find it. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. And I know we have a similar Women at Energy um, that, that has stories and vignettes about people that are working in energy. Um, and uh, if I can just put in too, also the Idaho National Laboratory actually had some um, 
career spotlights. And so those are, those are also kind of looking and seeing what happens at the Idaho National Laboratory through the virtual field trip that Rita mentioned is a way to see kind of what's going on there and, and looking for mentorships. So thank you for all of those questions. Um, let's see. Um, I've got one here. Um, how do you personally contribute to advancing women empowerment in STEM at your agency? And so we'll go um, Lisa, Sabrina, and then Rita. Sure. So currently I'm the champion for our Women of NASA employee group. Uh, in that role, I've actually sponsored some events to help our STEM women see what they need to do to advance their careers. Um, I also mentor a lot of the women in this group, uh, providing career advice, but I also uh, introduce them to other senior leaders so that they can expand their networks and get exposed to other types of positions and other folks who might be their mentors. And, you know, we've also talked about role models. Well, one of our scientists at the Langley Research Center developed role model training. And I actually brought her to NASA headquarters and we did a wonderful session with our senior uh, scientists and women engineers to understand what does it mean to be a role model. So when you go out and speak or when you uh, mentor someone, what does it mean to bring your story to them and how are you being perceived? And it's just received rave reviews and people keep asking me, when are we going to do another role model session? So I feel like that's something we can do internally to help bolster our women and convince them to get out there um, to speak to students. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Sabrina? Hoping, kind of hoping you forget about me because I, um, I actually okay. am not in this STEM uh, career. I, okay. um, I can speak to being a, I don't know, working mom, <laughs> right. which right. is another fun area. <laughs> but but I, I, rather, I think Rita can answer this. Instead. Thank you. Thanks, Sabrina. Rita? Sure. Um, a little bit uh, yeah, to, to what um, Lisa had mentioned as well is um, it's really important that when we do have a, a platform to speak from that we use it um, often, certainly judiciously, but often. Um, one of um, the first uh, speaking invitations that I had when I was in a leadership role was one that I was considering turning down just because um, yeah, you know, I, I didn't think it was really important, and I accepted it, and I went and I spoke, and more than one um, female came up to me afterwards and said, thank you for giving the speech. Um, it was really nice to see somebody like you up there, and what they meant was a female. It wasn't, you know, uh, my ethnicity. It wasn't my background. It was, it was just nice to see a female up there talking um, about this topic. Um, and so when, you know, it, it, once we have this platform, it's important to, to demonstrate and be that role model uh, and, and say, you know, I can do this. That means you can do it as well, right? Um, and, and, and just know that optically it's really important that folks see themselves in their leaders. And when they see leaders that look like them, um, it's, uh, I've been told, it's, a, it's sort of uh, motivating and um, if, depending on the message, I guess, inspirational. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, so we have another question from our audience, and um, someone wants to know, what advice would you give to females pursuing engineering this fall? Oh, I, I'm going to start with that one. Um, my son is also <laughs> starting to pursue engineering this fall, so I'm going to give you the same advice that, I that I've given to him, which um, hopefully you will listen to because he's not, it's, I'm just his mom, what do I know? <laughs> um, and, and that is if, if you're not, uh, if you have not decided on a particular discipline, 
get yourself exposure to every discipline that you can at that at that school at that university um you know whatever the case may be because once you start to to tour these different departments if you can take a course or a short course or get a tour of a civil department a mechanical materials nuclear um computers uh It'll, it'll give you a chance to get a flavor. And then um, if there's an opportunity to do some undergraduate, if, if you're talking about um, undergrad, doing undergraduate research with a professor, that's a really ideal way to get some hands-on understanding of, is this something I want to continue for four or five plus years? Um, or this, this field may not be for me, and let me pivot a little and try a different engineering discipline. So definitely, um, uh, I'm very excited that there are folks uh, going to start uh, pursuing engineering in the fall. Um, I uh, very much hope that you can attend um, in person, but if not, um, online is, will be the way that things start out and, and we'll see how things go. Uh, and my final uh, ending comment will be, uh, once you're done, let's touch base again, because I would love to have you join my workforce. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Rena. Oh, you can add can a I little bit. That. Um, so my daughter just finished her freshman year at Notre Dame in chemical engineering, and I, I think her rude awakening was a, it's a lot harder than high school, uh, and that in high school you, you sort of plowed through it on your own, and engineering tends to be much more demanding. Uh, it's harder to connect the dots from the curriculum you've had before. So feel free to reach out to those professors, teaching assistants, study groups, even a tutor if you need it. So don't feel ashamed that you think this is beyond you. No, it's part of the learning process and they're pushing you um, to see if you can really make it to that next step and level. And I would also um, advocate what Rita said. So at Notre Dame, they actually have an intro to engineering and the whole first semester is spent adjudicating the different disciplines and meeting alumni, um, industry people and tours just in all these different engineering areas. And they have this phenomenal statistic like 60% of the students change to a dis different discipline after they go through that semester. So really trying to understand, you know, is aerospace engineering really for you? Because, you know, it's a commitment and it's a long four years uh, and you really want to make sure it's, it's what you want on the end. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Sabrina, did you want to say something to yeah. that as well? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not qualified because again I didn't study uh, STEM in college. But um, what I did study and would like to make a plug for is um, English and literature and also art. I'm the complete opposite <laughs> of STEM, but I think there's a lot of value in um, being a good writer and having those kinds of classes. Not the art, but like the English literature and those kinds of classes help develop your writing skills because so much of your life is going to be emails and you know kind of how you present yourself to the world does matter and I would say this to anybody it's not just for women I mean anybody going to college to you know keep up with those other writing skills and grammar and and also different ways of thinking um, and I learned a lot through literature kind of how I think creatively and analytically is from that background and I'd also say I mean this is your shot I mean this is your chance to take whatever interesting thing you might want to take and I, I guess it's scary because you don't want to mess up your GPA because you fail or whatever but um after your first job your gpa doesn't matter as much and then also uh i shouldn't say that but i am and you know down the road i think you're going to really appreciate if you took a botany class or a pottery class or did something outside of what you did for your career because i'm not saying you're going to become a botanist but man like this is your shot it's really hard to go take classes when you're not 
in quarantine or in school. So if you don't mind me adding to that, um, in addition to my two uh, engineering degrees, I have an English degree. And I totally agree with you. I think I've gotten through my career being a very good writer, right? An engineer who can write <laughs> is an oxymoron. <laughs> but that was my A in STEAM before we knew STEAM. So I highly recommend being as well-rounded as possible. All right, thank you guys very much. We've got a couple more questions coming in. So um, there's a question here that um, they're asking, have your programs considered to do outreach to young girls that have gotten into trouble and wound up in juvenile detention centers or coming out of prison, possibly offer these ladies a second opportunity to turn their lives around and consider pursuing an education in the STEM field? So I'll start. Um, I can say no, we haven't. Our um, education program that's funded through Congress is really a K through 12 and then some higher ed right, mostly internships, mm -hmm. fellowships, and some design challenges. So we haven't really gone outside of the education boundaries. Um, I do know we had a partnership with Boys and Girls Clubs of America to enable um, some students who may not get the exposure to STEM and NASA work to get some experience in their aftercare programs to help steer them um, through those after school hours that could lead to um, non-productive work. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I think we have time for about two more questions. So any advice or thoughts on how to encourage girls and women in other disciplines to support STEM in their careers? For instance, um, she gives for an example, operational support grant writing, et cetera. I think this goes yeah, back Sabrina. to what yeah. I was saying earlier about, and what Lisa was speaking about, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know, I feel like I'm a one trick pony. Good writing is <laughs> I think very important. For that, I, I also think, as um, Rita said, to be a well-rounded person. I mean, these are all, it's all part of who you are. You're not like a career, you're a person. So I don't know if that really answers the question. Um, it's kind of a, a big question, but um, I think getting as much practical experience and life skills, I mean, I've learned a lot from all the jobs I've had, all of them. I mean, I worked, I got my job at this, like my uh, rotation or whatever at the State Department in large part because I'd worked at Nordstrom and I had like retail experience. So the fact that like I've had a lot of customer service, like I had customer service oriented jobs before uh, working in government, like I understood kind of that relationship. So um, I, I was shocked. Like I was really shocked essentially that all my experiences that were wildly different than, you know, public policy and government really fed into that career. So I don't know if that answers the question and I hope it helps. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, I think, I think if it's okay with everybody, we'll move on to kind of our last question. If you could speak directly to students on the call today and give them just one word to reflect on as they begin their career journey, what would that be and why? And Rita, we'll start with you. One word, uh, experiment. Good, perfect, perfect. Okay, Lisa. Had to unmute. Unmute. Okay. Um, so my word is perseverance. It has always been a personal word that I believed in, but I was so excited this year 
when NASA decided to name our Mars 2020 rover Perseverance. And students wrote essays to um, name the rover, and then we voted. And I think I gave multiple votes to that word. <laughs> but for me, it's not just about the, the rugged challenge of a rover on Mars, but for one's career journey, it really is this long time horizon you're going to live through, and there's going to be successes and failures and ups and downs. And you just got to keep your purpose in mind and persevere to get through it. It's your career and you'll make it what you want. Okay, thank you, Lisa. All right, Sabrina. Well, so one word. Uh, mine is similar. Oh, I, I'm not good at one word. Uh, tenacity. <laughs> so um, I was thinking that I, may I explain? <laughs> yeah, I'll keep it sure. I had a, a friend, I was entering grad school, and I went to grad school like 10 years, after, or nine years after I graduated undergrad, and that was a big, it was a big change, it was a big deal, and she was actually a physicist, and she said what got her through school was having the tenacity of a bulldog, and I always remembered that, and um, I think I like, I use the word perseverance more than tenacity, but you, you really have to hang on to what you want. And even if you don't know what you want, like hang on to something and then find the next thing, but don't, don't give up. Always find another way to do things. You know, it, it just, just doesn't serve you to give up without giving it your best and just not giving up at all. I think just moving on to something new. So you are constantly propelled forward, but I did like tenacity. Um, I thought that was a good one. Staff be a bulldog. I like that. That's great. Thank you. Well, I think um, that about does it for us. I want to thank all of our panelists, Sabrina, Rita, and Lisa, for being here today and sharing their wisdom and expertise with, with us in advancing young women in STEM. And I want to thank you, the participants, for taking time to be with us today. Um, there will be a survey at the end when you click off of this webinar. We would love for you to go on and um, answer those questions a little bit about the webinar. And if there's also any unanswered questions that you have, please put them um, in the box on the survey and we'll get those to the panelists so we can get back to you. So thank you so much and we hope to see you at South by Southwest EDU in 2021. So thanks. Thank you. Rita, are you still there?